it's nine o'clock on a Monday afternoon and you are watching Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host Pete McGuinness-Mark and this is Research in Manoa and every week we introduce some interesting new science discoveries from the university and it's my great pleasure today to have Lisa Hanvona and Amanda Ziegler, two oceanographers. Uh, Amanda is a biological oceanographer and Lisa is a physical oceanographer. And this is going to be a really interesting discussion because before the show, I was saying that I know virtually nothing about physical or biological <laughs> oceanography. So uh, I'm going to learn an awful lot today uh, about what you ladies actually do. Um, Amanda, you are a graduate student, which means this is what you're working on for your PhD, correct? Correct. And then Lisa, you've been here at Manoa for about a year as a postdoctoral fellow, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and you've had some background not only working in Antarctica, but also in the Atlantic. Uh, in terms of trying to study it. So um, for our audience, can you just give us a description? What do biological and physical oceanographers do? Lisa, if you could go first. OK. So thanks for having us, first of all. I'm very excited. Um, so what does a physical oceanographer do? I mean, um, it's a whole range of things. We basically want to understand um, the interaction of the ocean with the atmosphere, um, how oceans move, also because uh, the Earth is rotating, that brings in um, energy into the ocean. You've got the tides from the moon. So you've got this whole range of um, topics that you can look at in really big dimensions, but also in a small one. So there's like, um, my thesis was about turbulence at the upper ocean. So this is basically how wind and surface um, solar radiation, so sunshine, would um, change the movement of the water at the water surface. Uh, and of course, since we live in Hawaii, surrounded by the Pacific Ocean, presumably understanding the dynamics of the ocean and how it interacts with the atmosphere is really important to everybody living here in Hawaii. Yeah, I mean, uh, you wouldn't have waves if there you wouldn't, wouldn't be this waves. interaction. Oh, so. okay. And then Amanda, you, you study more of the biology, correct? Correct. Yes. So uh, what type of uh, uh, animals do you look at? Or are you looking at little small phytoplankton <laughs> or, or big sharks or something like yeah. that? Yeah, again, thank you for having us. Um, well, for biological oceanography, again, as Lisa echoes, it's, it could be a range of, um, looking at a range of organisms. My personal specialty is looking at benthic ecology, so I'm interested in the animals that live on the sea floor in a range of habitats, and I'm specifically interested in Antarctica. Um, I also mainly look at larger animals, so anything, we call it megafauna, anything larger than around a centimeter or so that you could identify from uh, photography or from video. Okay, so anything like you that. can see, yeah. <laughs> because there are other investigators sure. at Manoa who look at really f small phytoplankton mm -hmm. and uh, sort of water the, the, the column, water color and that sort of thing. So you, uh, Amanda, you're primarily interested with things which live on the bottom? Yes. Correct. Everything and on the seafloor. <laughs> that you can see with your eyes mm -hmm. if you are lucky enough to be. Yes. No. diving on the bottom uh, and then Lisa presumably you're interested in how the physical environment whether it's saline water or whether um, you've got melt water, melt water fresh water, water. Fresh yeah. water. And, and so I presume that's one reason why both of you are interested in Antarctica because you've got this really interesting interplay between fresh water from the ice sheets and the ocean saline water and how it's mixing and how it affects life forms, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we've got um, some pictures, so I always like having some illustrations uh, in this show. Uh, and I think this sort of encapsulates how adventurous you two <laughs> young ladies really are. Uh, 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 yeah. Is this your field area? Yeah, yeah. this is actually uh, a picture we just took in March um, this year when we went to our final um, research trip down to Antarctica to Antwerp Bay, uh, the fjord that we are studying, it's at the Western Antarctic Peninsula, so um, relatively uh, high up in the north. I think we looked it up, what was it in Alaska? Fairbanks. So Fairbanks. It's Fairbanks. similar to yeah. Fairbanks, so it's about yeah. 65 yeah. south, right? But yeah, so it's on the other <laughs> side. Other side but it's of Fairbanks, like, uh, okay. Um, uh, and we saw this uh, ship. How big was the ship? You know, how long were you there? And 
Um, well, Did we you stayed get seasick? Five weeks on the on the ship, um, we were about thirty to forty people on board, uh, including the crew, and um, the. Adventurous part, I would say, is crossing the Drake Passage. So from yeah. South America and Chile, we started, um, went down to Palma Station, which took about four days. Four days, okay. And um, it was my first trip, so I can only say it was um, okay. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, and and you Amanda, you, you were on this uh, yep. ship as yep. well? Yeah. So this was, as Lisa said, this was our uh, third cruise for this particular project, mm -hmm. so we were both on this um, last one together. Uh, this particular research vessel that was pictured, um, the Lawrence M. Gould, it doubles as a supply vessel for one of the U.S. research stations at Palmer Station. As she mentioned, we have to stop there first. We bring supplies, scientists to and from um, Chile back and forth to the to the uh, research station there okay. before we can then go on and do our own research. And, and, and your research would be you'd be on station for several weeks or. So our, our work was all um, entirely ship-based. We have a couple cameras and different instruments, weather stations on land, um, but everything else we did based on the ship. So we would do different measurements of instruments that we put over the side or off the back, um, towed different instruments. So we're collecting all of our data from the ship or deploying instruments that stay on the seafloor, uh, moorings that stay anchored to the seafloor for months at a time, and then we have to go back turn them around, take data off of them, put new batteries in, and hopefully retrieve them at the end. Yeah. <laughs> and, and presumably, if you're based off of the ship, mm -hmm. life is a little bit more comfortable than if you were camping on the... the, the, the I'd imagine, yes. Insular, <laughs> yeah. Sort of yeah. Yeah. It's warm. It's warm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unless you fall in the water. Yeah. Presumably, the water's near freezing. It right? is, it's yes. a yeah, really around. cold environment. You wouldn't yeah. want to go swimming in that. I, and um, <laughs> I, I think the next image, which you brought along, uh, actually shows some of the challenges of deploying some of your instrumentation. So, uh, Lisa, can you tell us, um, the person down at the bottom of the image is standing next to what appears to be a cylinder. Is that yeah. like, what, what, what uh, kinds of things? It's a rosette, you think, also. It's a, it's a round measurement device, and it has all of these bottles uh, mm -hmm. attached to it. And um, you call it a CTD, so it's a um, you measure salinity, temperature, and depth with it. Um, but in these bottles, you can actually take uh, water samples within the water column. So you can take a, a couple of liters of water at, for example, 500 meter depth, and then at 300 meter depth, and that can give you insight on the, um, the chemical composition, for example, or if you have. A plankton or a krill or any mm -hmm. kind of creatures in that water. And, and both the conductivity and the temperature presumably tell you whether you're seeing regular seawater or it's being flooded by all melt water from the ice sheet. Is yeah, that, it's um, actually there's like so much you can see just in this um, a profile because you have the surface water, which is like uh, might be a lot of fresh water coming in from melting glaciers mm -hmm. or melting icebergs. Um, then uh, if you go deeper, there might be an uh, incoming current at depth. So there's, especially in the fjord that we look at, we, we think that there's um, deeper water coming off the ocean into that area, which surfaces there because of the bottom topography, so little mm. hills on the sea floor. Yeah, Amanda, why, why do you pick a fjord? And a fjord is a drowned, glaciated valley, is that correct? Correct. So it's been carved by the glaciers yeah. over time, and now okay. it's essentially like a canyon might be on, on land, but it's um, submerged. Um, fjords are really interesting places to study because they are such um, steep walled regions, so you get a lot of different uh, biology on the, on the walls, on the sea floor. It also concentrates a lot of organic matter, so all of the productivity, all the animals, the plants um, living in the surface ocean may collect in that in that deeper basin. So we're curious how this is different from the open shelf um, surrounding the rest of the continent. So a fjord is a key locality to go and make a variety of measurements, and presumably it's more sheltered as well, so you don't get beat up by rough waves or something like that. Yeah, it's very, very calm when we're inside very the fjord. Calm. It's very glass yeah, and calm. It look, look, <laughs> looked very yeah. idyllic in that yeah. first image. Yeah. And I think we've got another instrument um, being deployed showing in the, this image. Uh, and Lisa, you said that it was collecting um, 
water samples at different depths. Is that what we're seeing down here at the bottom left? No, this is actually a specialty of Amanda. <laughs> oh, well, Amanda, in fact, yeah. about the I told you I knew nothing about this. So. I mean, I wouldn't have known uh, uh, a couple of months ago. Okay, either. Amanda, what, what is it we are looking yeah, at? Yeah, so here? we're looking at a sediment trap, and so we put this down on a mooring, which is anchored to the seafloor. It's sitting around 150 meters above the, the bottom of the seafloor. Um, and it's essentially a giant cone. It's exactly what it looks like. It uh, concentrates all of the sinking material coming out down onto the seafloor. So that's essentially all of the food that the animals on the seafloor, for, unless they're eating each other, they need that to survive. Okay. And how long would you have to leave uh, this cone actually on the floor to get a representative sample? So it has 21 um, sampling bottles in it, so we actually can uh, vary how long each bottle is collecting for. So we, first deployment, we left this out for around four or five months and got all those 21 samples, turned it around, left it out for another four months, and then it was left out for another year. So you have to kind of change the uh, sampling interval on that. But, but typically you might leave, oh, for one of those sampling bottles, mm -hmm. you might have data which were collected over uh, a few weeks to a couple Correct. of months or something it's like that. usually a couple of weeks. And, and how much sediment do you actually get accumulated? Is it you know, like a very thin layer or do you get you know, uh, a big sample? Yeah, so that um, the picture actually before was showing it really well with all 21 bottles lined up. It varies significantly throughout the year. So when you have these pulses of the material sinking out, um, all of the, am the plants that were growing in the surface, you'll get a really thick deposit of uh, sediment. It might be a couple centimeters thick of this green flocky material. And other times throughout the winter, it seems like there's very, very little coming down. No, no real sunlight for phytoplankton to grow, or it may be covered by sea ice. So it's a really seasonal habitat for, for animals right. relying on this. And, and the goal of the collection is primarily to look at what the food source is for all of the animals that are living on the bottom of the fjord. Yeah, so this, the sediment trap can be, uh, it's a way to quantify that amount, the flux, the part, uh, particular organic carbon flux to the seafloor, which is, as I said, it's the, basically all the food that the animals on the seafloor rely on. Okay, has, has this been done for a long time, or are these sort of uh, pioneering measurements so you've got no long-term time series to study? So inside the fjord, this hasn't been done very, um, very often. A lot of the fjords on the Western Arctic Peninsula have been visited but not very well studied um, throughout time. There is a long-term ecological uh, research project that, LTER for short, yeah. um, that occurs since, I don't know, it's at least 25 years now on the outer shelf um, on the peninsula, and they employ the same uh, sediment traps. So we have long-term records from outside of the fjords, but nothing inside. You can probably guess where I'm heading with this in that um, in the second half of the show we'll probably consider a little bit of you know, what the changing environment is like with uh, climate change, um, trying to find out if you are seeing it for the first time or whether you're seeing it as part of a longer 25-year record of that sort of thing. I think we've got time, just one more image if we can show the, the next image. And this is, I, I'm guessing, Amanda, this is <laughs> yeah. uh, some of the large critters that you like to look at. Um, can you tell us anything about what we're seeing? Yeah, so this is a shot taken from uh, one of the trawls that we did. This is essentially a very large net which we drag along the bottom, um, and it scoops up all of the animals that's in its way and <laughs> some of the mud. Uh, we spend a few hours on deck, maybe even up to six hours, rinsing them off and sorting them uh, by their identification. So in the photo, we've got a lot of bright um, orange. Those are uh, sea stars, like some asteroids you might see around here, but they're different species. Inconveniently, they don't have a scale bar with them. How big are some of these animals? Um, so those were maybe a few inches across. Okay. Um, they do get much larger. Uh, but in this photo, there's also an octopus kind of in the center there. Again, a few a few inches long. A uh, very large scale worm beneath that. It looks just kind of like a giant, giant worm there um, in the center. And those are really interesting animals in the Antarctic because they're uh, predators and they're some of the top predators in these systems. And these would be living at depth of, what, 400 meters, something like that? Yep, they can go deeper as well. But in the fjord, we were collecting them from deep basins around 500. Okay, well, we'll talk more about these uh, after the uh, break. Let me just remind you, you are watching Think Tech Hawaii, research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and I have Amanda Ziegler and Lisa Hanvonan with me today, both oceanographers, one biology, one physical oceanography, and uh, we'll be talking a bit more as we come back at the second half of the show. See you then.
Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world. You can beat the war. You can talk to God go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up. You can beat the clock. You can move a mountain. You can break rocks. You can be a master. Don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. And welcome back. You are watching Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa, and I'm your host, Pete McGuinness Mark. We're looking at ecology of the ocean deep, or ecology off the shores of Antarctica, with uh, Amanda Ziegler and Lisa Hanlonen. Welcome to you both again. It's really fascinating that this is a field I have very little common knowledge of. So can you just give me some idea, what's it like working in this kind of environment? You're on a ship, it's really cold, you're trying to study something you know, 400 meters beneath you in the ship. Um, it must be an exciting experience, right? Yeah, it was um, really breathtaking, first of all. Uh, for me, it was the first time going down there and to see this really wonderful landscapes, like yeah. uh, untouched and and huge dimension. I mean, the the um, mountains go up to 2,000 meters at times, and it's like just at the sea. And, and, and um, this is on the West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, fairly close to Palmer yeah. Station, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and Amanda, have you been down there before, or is this uh, your first visit? Yep, this was actually my third trip down in the past year and a half, so I'm pretty rapid <laughs> fire cruising. <laughs> 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 a lot yeah. of time spent away from Hawaii. That yes, was quite, 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 quite yeah. a challenge. Yes. Yeah. But uh, the, the working environment, I mean, do you work like an eight hour day or do you work around the clock or, or, or you know, how much break time do you get? It really depends. Um, so on this cruise that we've been, there's different projects involved. Mm -hmm. uh, there were different projects involved. So it always depends on can you work uh, 24 hours? Do you have work during the day and at night? or um, if you have land-based operations. So our project was basically from, uh, most of the time from ship, and um, you've seen these CTD measurements before, mm -hmm. and this is something you can take also at night. So there were some, when you have to recover an instrument and you have to see the instrument, you would go during the day and have different teams assigned to different jobs, and then you would shift around like have another shift starting at 8 o'clock in the evening after dinner that would work then until the next morning on another uh, project. And, and Amanda, you say you've been there three times. Mm -hmm. Do you go back to the same place every time or do you get to see more of the landscape? Um, typically on the first two cruises we were exclusively studying the one fjord um, and Bird Bay as she mentioned mm -hmm. and um, a little bit a little station out on the uh, open shelf. On this last cruise, we actually were working with a lot of other projects involved, so we were sharing ship time, and so we actually saw most of the peninsula all the way down below the Antarctic Circle, yeah. so which was really exciting, very yeah. different. So, yeah. so 24 yeah. hours of daylight, presumably, if you were there. Yeah. No. Not no. as much no. as the time. No, no. Yeah. no. Okay. A very beautiful sunsets and sunrises. <laughs> Sounds spectacular. Now, of course, the 800-pound gorilla in the room You've been going down there several times, and we're worried, or we hear a lot of the news about, say, the breakup of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet um, and, and global climate change. Is your research uh, related to how we might be seeing changes in the ecosystem down there? Have yeah. you seen this personally, or do your colleagues, your advisor, the mentor? Um, well, the aim of our project is to understand how everything connects in the system, so how the glaciers could affect um, the growth of the plankton at the surface and thereby how much food the benthic uh, level, uh, so the sea floor would get. And so uh, we have measured that there's an increase of temperature mm -hmm. in this area, which is 
about two degrees, which is pretty high. So we expect there's an, um, a change in how much melt water comes in. And to understand what this would be for the ecosystem, we first have to understand what is going on right now. Sure. We hear a lot about how the coral reefs around Hawaii are being stressed out uh, through thermal bleaching as well yeah. as ocean acidification. Amanda, do you see the same kind of stress maybe in some of the uh, animals which you're identifying on the floor of the, the fjords? Do they look as if they're really healthy or are they also starting to respond in the same way that our coral reefs uh, in, right. in trouble around Hawaii? So the Antarctic's actually pretty different, um, a different system and the major reason is that the water column is around freezing, as you mentioned, in temperature from the surface all the way to the sea floor. So temperatures may be around minus one degree C, maybe as high as two degrees C, but that's a really small temperature range. And most other organisms, even if they're in the deep sea, may exhibit or most may experience a much uh, larger temperature difference. So um, I haven't personally seen I don't have enough data actually to say that I can see any long-term uh, changes but, in the benthos. But theoretically, if there's a greater influx of fresh water from the melting ice sheets, we expect that it would have. That could be a similar stressor to say uh, the acidification at our latitude mm -hmm. affecting the coves. Is that correct? So it wouldn't be unexpected to see some kind of change. Exactly. Okay. We don't really know how it's going to manifest, and that is one of the, the major questions we want to assess is what is the status of this ecosystem now, and how is that projected to change if we increase the fl freshwater flux coming off the glaciers, if they're, you know, increased melting, or if we increase the temperature of the fjord water, what will, hap what will that have um, an impact on the, on the organisms and the entire ecosystem? And Lisa, as a physical oceanographer, we, we know that around the Arctic Ocean, Antarctic Ocean, um, that's where a lot of the, the base of the food chain is. Yeah. Do, do your studies of the sort of the physical oceanography uh, of the area hint that there's any problems, or is this sort of a still uh, uh, untested territory where we don't really have the time series to say one way or the other? Well, um, concerning the food chain, um, it is uh, it provides now a lot of food to, to all levels, so it's like the krill, but also bigger um, whales, and um, well, currently we have enough food, but if the, the currents might change, uh, not the currents change, um, <laughs> um, if, if the stratification, for example, so how the, the fjord is layered, because you have fresh water coming on top of salty water, which doesn't like to mix as much, uh, with the heavy salty water. This could change the productivity at the surface and thereby also um, how much food you have, but also how, um, how much nutrients come into the water and the water is um, transported out onto the, uh, onto the ocean and there it can provide iron, for example, which is like one of the key um, nutrient for, for growth outside. So this increases the importance of people like the two of you doing longer term studies because we really aren't under, uh, clear exactly how the environment is changing. So hopefully this is your career. <laughs> so you can so. actually go on. Yeah. Let's take a look at another slide uh, and see. Uh, and this looks as if it's uh, nighttime operations, correct? Uh, and uh, um, uh, the people here, what are they doing, Lisa? Are they sorting through uh, something from one of these dredges? Or? Um, well, I presume this is a, a box core. Uh, so it? This was actually one of the trawls that the oh, that uh, animals yeah. were shown in the, okay, in the previous so slide. So the previous slide yeah. pulled so the up all result. of that. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So this, this is, is the finish what we have result. to do to, uh, to sort through the animals. Once it comes up, uh, we spend a few hours out on deck sorting through. You can see everyone's quite bundled because it was pretty cold out on deck. Um, and sorting through all the different animals, sorting them into all those different buckets by what uh, what organism they are. Okay, and NSF is the National Science Foundation, right? Yeah. Which presumably funded all of your, your yeah. research down there. Uh, and uh, do we have another slide? I think uh, this is just a, a really pretty view. I mean, anybody uh, would love to go and yeah. uh, see this kind of scenery. I mean, presumed the weather wasn't always this good, though. Uh, uh, we were actually pretty lucky on this cruise that we had a lot of sunny days really? and we heard every day it's going to be stormy and snowy tomorrow but yeah. it uh, didn't happen until the very end. But that was, I mean, if you look at this picture you can see 
um, it's a very calm environment, and so it looks terrific. Um, there's sudden wind bursts coming up every now and then. It can mix up the whole fjord, and then it's when um, uh, the nutrients are provided to the surface. Um, water is actually washed out um, of the fjord into um, as out into the ocean, and this is when the nutrients get supplied. And of course, the, the glaciers right in the middle of this field of view, that's what presumably is advancing into the ocean. Yeah, okay. so you, um, I don't know which glacier this is exactly, but we have one glacier that is moving like five meters a day as an average. So you see there's a lot of ice and f uh, fresh water budget coming in if it would be melting. It's moving forward five meters. How thick is it, or how wide? So it can be up to a, a hundred meters up uh, meters above the surface. Thick, and yeah. how, uh, what's the width? So, so we're, we're, how, we're seeing. Um, I think it's pretty. It's almost a kilometer wide. I mean, it's she, huge. Huge volumes of water yeah. per day yeah. entering into the fjord, and of course, this is fresh yeah. water. So. Yeah, but it doesn't mean that it melts right away in the fjord. So you also have these huge icebergs that are just drifting out of the fjord. I, I'm thinking back to a few weeks ago when we had Mark, Matt Barbie come and talk to us about sea level rise mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Yeah. The glaciers advancing into the water presumably float, but they displace more water. So if they're moving faster now than they were in the past, that's going to impact sea level rise as well. Yeah, it's going to put more water. Yeah. I think you've got a, a, an image actually next one up. Yes, this is, I guess, um, a good, a good starting point or a good ending point for us. This is showing where uh, your study areas were and uh, down in the bottom right of course is the continent of Antarctica um, but then the top left uh, we've got a colored diagram um, I'm not quite sure we've got is this the bathymetry? Of yeah the that's a bathymetry and um, I put this slide and that's the water depth right? Um, that's the depth so it's kind okay. of like the topography but in okay. reverse to the ocean okay. um, and um, this image shows uh, the model domain that we are working with. Okay. I, I'm afraid it, I'm being told in my left ear that <laughs> we have got uh, virtually no time left. But uh, uh, Lisa, I'd like to thank you for coming thank on the show. Much. And Amanda, good luck with your graduate <laughs> career. You. I hope you can yeah. continue this later on. Well, thank you for uh, watching today's show. Just a reminder, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark. And today we've been hearing all about the ecology in the ocean depths uh, off of the coast of Antarctica. Remind you that we show every Monday at 1 o'clock, Hawaii Standard Time. So until next week, thank you very much for viewing. Goodbye for now.